Hi, so we're now, um, this is Guido Trotter, and he'll talk to us about uh, owning the network with Linux or advanced uh, networking. Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, I already gave some form of this talk uh, in New York. This is a dated version from two years ago. How many people were there? A few, okay, so we can restart from scratch, I guess, rather than just going to the updates. Um, so the idea of this talk came out during some work I did for the Ganetti project, and it was related of, of um, it was about basically doing more things uh, at the network layer with Linux. So how many things do you already do with virtualization that somehow go in the domain of uh, uh, switches and network administrator and other people uh, that basically own the network or used to own the network until now. And somehow we're getting into that space and so we're looking at what we can do at the Linux level right now without bringing in all the virtualization part. Just let's discuss about the network. Uh, so basically we used to have uh, big Cisco switches and small Cisco switches and other brands as well managing the network, but those were all proprietary boxes, basically, with a full operating system on them, but basically only, like, not, not modifiable at all. Uh, we might have some free switches, but I don't know much about them. Now we have free routers, at least, to start. Um, so we started using Linux on servers, and nowadays, somehow, like, the, the, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, I, I couldn't hear me anymore. That's strange. Okay, um, so somehow we, we scared off all the proprietary server people and we owned the uh, server world, and now let's scare off some networking people as well. So let's start integrating and taking over their area. Um, why? Well, networking is fun. Uh, much of this is not very well documented. Like, you'll, you'll be able to do things with uh, IP, for example, that the IP mount page forgets to mention and the IP online help kind of says something about it, but not really. And I didn't want to write documentation, so I just wrote a talk, and you can all try it, and then some, someday we'll write documentation, maybe. Uh, so, yeah, you, you can try this. It's, it's quite safe. Before doing it at your office, try to talk to people, not over lunch, and make sure it, they're okay with what you're trying to do because they're not expecting it, definitely. So this is just basic things that you're all used to do. Uh, we can just... Great. <laughs> okay, so we can just easily add an address to an interface, um, set the link of the interface up or down, so activate or deactivate the interface, uh, just do simple bridging. Uh, that's what we do normally to create virtual machines and then attach them to a bridge. Uh, and then we can do basic routing, like just enable routing. This will allow traffic from one interface to go to the other interface. We all know this, hopefully, but just to put things in context. Um, so what are we going to talk about? Well, a bit about VLANs, uh, tunneling, policy routing and what's policy routing and some asymmetric routing, um, a bit of about routing demons, some load balancing, network namespaces, and some open vSwitch, which is kind of the update that I had. So VLAN tagging. Um, so over a single port, we can have many VLANs uh, we need to have our switch cooperate with this. Either it has to be very, very dumb, or it needs to somehow know about tagging and it needs to allow us to trunk. So it needs to configure the port as trunking and also allow explicitly the VLANs that we're going to use or allow all of them. Um, so you can easily add a link to your uh, network card, so you can say add link to ATH0, name ATH0.3, type VLAN ID free. Uh, you can create an interface in ETC network interfaces that will do that. So I, um, if up down will help you to set that up 
or you can do it manually. Uh, then you can add an IP on that interface and set it up. And now basically you have a second interface which is kind of insulated from your VLAN 0, from your ATH 0, and is on a VLAN. Now, fun thing is that your HDH0 can appear on another VLAN according to the switch configuration. So what's the untagged traffic for you might be tagged traffic from the point of view of the switch. So you'll have to be careful how this is all configured and not to tag the traffic for the interface you're untagged on and things like that. Um, so that's, that's just it. By the way, at any point, if you have questions or you have doubts, you don't understand something, feel free to or you have indeed comments or helpful suggestions, feel free to interrupt me or feel free to ask me questions at the end, however you feel. Um, so tunneling is something at layer three. Basically at VLAN level, we are only limited at the like, data center level or anyway at the switching level. At layer three, we can transmit IP over IP so we can create overlay networks and allow basically traffic mobility uh, change things under the networking people. And this we can do without making some people notice, although once they find out, they're going to hate us. Um, so this is a very basic example. We can add a tunnel on our host zero. Um, it's a GRE tunnel. Uh, we set up a peer, so we decide where that this does go, and then we turn it up. On this other network, uh, which is at layer three, like hopefully, well, in this case, they might even be in the same, but let's say that they are on two different slash 24s. Um, you add another GRE tunnel, this two network can cooperate, and so now you have basically the GRE zero interface on the two connected, and you can ping 4.2 from 4.1 and vice versa, and you can also route traffic over this link. Um, you can then do things like bridge traffic over, like encapsulating uh, Ethernet over IP over IP over Ethernet, which is kind of, well, you can anyway. Another cool thing you can do is, well, uh, suppose we have this. No, 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 go, go back, go back. Suppose we have this, but we have many nodes. Uh, if we have three, well, we can create tunnels between all of them. If we have five, it starts to not scale, basically. You have n square tunnels. Uh, you couldn't maintain them, even if you have an automated system to maintain them. It's going to be a bit of a mess. Uh, you can start creating concentrators, but when you have single point of failures, or you have to create more of them, and this is going to complicate things a bit. So one thing you can do is you can do a full mesh by creating a tunnel with just maybe a key which means that you can have more than one tunnel on the same machine, but not specify what the remote endpoint is. Um, at this point, basically you can decide what the remote endpoint is by creating a neighbor table entry with an IP address as its destination. So normally a neighbor table entry is something where you have an IP address and an Ethernet MAC address on the other side. If for this uh, device, you create basically an IP address as the destination rather than a MAC address. This will mean that once you ping an address, like I don't know, 4.1, this will be looked up in the neighbor table and then it will be encapsulated over GRE to this other device that we specified there over IPN. This means that we can create only one. GRE tunnel per um, device that we want to connect. So we have, I don't know, these five Linux boxes. We create exactly one GRE tunnel, and then we can dynamically reconfigure the neighbor table, either manually or with uh, some user space daemon that updates it, or uh, by a uh, ARP daemon to actually redirect traffic dynamically where we want, depending on uptime or where our virtual machine, for example, is. Um, the verb daemon requires a kernel patch that is not enabled in many kernels, I think, and it's, it's a bit more flaky, but the other option to just inject the neighbor table entries works quite well. So policy routing, what's 
policy routing? Well, it's just routing, really. The difference is that with normal routing, we just can route on the destination IP. Uh, because the people who thought about writing, routing first wanted to keep it simple. But nowadays, we could say, well, I want to route differently depending on the source IP or on the protocol. Maybe I have a slow link and a fast link. Or maybe I want something completely different. OK. Um, does anybody have another one of these keyboards and is making a joke about this? OK, nothing. It's just moving without me. Um, so basically, yeah. We can decide different routing tables depending on some uh, uh, entries, on some values, and then on that routing table decide the actual destination. Uh, this is just a double lookup that is done in Linux to simplify or complicate this thing, I guess. Um, so how does it work? You first add a rule that says, look, if the device from which this packet comes from is GRE0, use table 100. So don't use your default routing table that the node traffic uses, but start using something else. And then in table 100, you can decide to do quite a lot of interesting things. You can say, well, um, you can basically replace routes and do different things. So this means that the traffic coming from some interface will be routed differently without affecting your network traffic from the host or on the host itself. This will make it very fun to debug. Um, yeah, and yeah, these are just examples. Uh, we can, for example, decide that default uh, default routing we are gateway. Uh, basically, we can put things on the same. I, I don't remember what this was. <laughs> Sorry, but. It works and it allows you to do different traffic for this. Um, so you can do it for specific packets rather than just interfaces where this is from. We can use the help of IP tables by saying, OK, if a packet matches some things, and we know that IP tables can match on basically everything, including uh, it's not really regex, but bit field matching on the packet itself. So it's basically anything you can dream of on the packet. We can say, well, mark it for uh, like number 100. And then we have this rule that says that if the marker from the firewall is 100, use table 100. And this allows us to do uh, basically marking for any type of, of packet. Asymmetric policy routing allows us to process uh, that. I don't remember this one either. I should have gone through this more, I guess. Uh, from what do I remember, throw. Mm. It throws this to a different table, to the main table. Sorry? This throws it, this network to the main table. OK, so it allows you to basically, for some things, default back to the main table. So it allows you to decide that this table only overrides some of the rules and the rest goes normally. Thank you. So routing daemons, um, this will basically allow to you to configure this uh, by making various boxes talk to each other, both Linux to Linux or Linux to router, and um, uh, acquire routes and push it either to your main network table or to some particular tables that then you'll use the way we said before. Um, so for example, at this point, we can use these routes just for our host SVMs or for our MBMA networks, which are the networks, uh, uh, the GRE tunnels we were talking about. So we could use the uh, network daemon, for example, to acquire where our VMs are and then push these neighbor table entries for them. Uh, or for any Anycast service that we run or, and load balance on. So for example, on our machine, we have an Anycast IP address. We receive traffic. And then we want to know where to direct it. We could use a routing daemon for that, as well as the other technologies we were, we were talking about before, later. Um, 
An easy one is, well, an easy one, quite good one is Quagga. It's quite easy to install. Uh, then you can see it, for example, you can, for example, do a quick test just on your laptop or on a single server by installing Quagga on multiple virtual machines and then make them create routes on them and then make them talk to each other and basically share the routing table over OSPF or BGP. Um, OSPF is more used inside organizations. BGP is the global internet one, but some organizations prefer BGP for everything, mostly because they already have it and they think that it's useless to run two different protocols. Um, and yeah, then you want to make your routing daemon interact with uh, uh, your static routes that you set up from before, either by acquiring them or by pushing your routes through the routing daemon and then the routing daemon will update the, the network table. So what's Anycast? With Anycast we can run an IP in multiple locations. Basically we just use Quagga or another network daemon or indeed a proprietary one on, on some router to uh, publish this from more than one place at the same level. This means that Automatically, the network will configure itself to go to the nearest one, and it's very easy. Uh, if you were wondering, it's how things like the Google DNS is uh, uh, 8888 and 8844 are run. There's no one central server that we use for that, and many of the root name servers now do this as well, so they're not actually one box, but there are many boxes pretending to be at a particular IP address that is configured on all the world devices, and they can't change anymore. Um, and yeah, it's, it's quite easy. If you start doing it a lot, one IP by one IP, people will get mad at you because their routing tables will explode. So maybe you want to anycast full networks or maybe you just won't care and still do it. But uh, this is a good way to basically push services over multiple data centers and make sure that everything automatically reconfigures. If your data center A goes down, then hopefully your BGP broadcasts will, or your BGP uh, advertisements will stop going out and automatically all the traffic will go somewhere else. This will take some time and it's of course better if you have better ways, but it's still better than having a single point of failure. Um, load balancing. So we have this Linux virtual server project. As I say, the worst name, ever for a project that does actually things at the networking level and not at the virtual server level. I guess their excuse is that virtual servers were not that popular when they started. But yes, this confuses things a bit. So it's not actually a virtual server, but it's just virtual IPs. This allows you to have a central box that advertises more than one IP. Uh, you can do that by basically just putting it on the network and then have on the other side uh, tunneling or just direct uh, MAC routing or like layer two MAC routing of the data to your backend destinations, which means that the traffic basically arrives at your data center, gets to the load balancer and then gets balanced over your actual machines that serve the request and machines can be inserted or removed from there dynamically and even automatically if a machine doesn't respond, it will be put down by your virtual server, or you can do it remotely or over layer three over GRE or some other tunnel. Although the defect of doing that is that when your traffic sometimes has to go back through the tunnel and then out, while if you do it directly, the machine can respond directly to the, the request without involving your load balancer on the return path, which of course allows you to scale more. Uh, for once, this project has amazing documentation. So you can just go there and try things that they uh, document in their man page and manuals. Uh, and as, well, as I was saying, you can either do not load balancing or tunnel or direct routing. So uh, what's a network namespace? This is something that came with uh, Linux containers and it's a way basically to insulate a process from the network of the host. So you can put a process in a separate namespace for indeed many things besides the network, just uh, VPS files, VPS 
entries so it won't see what other processes run on the machines or and will believe itself to be in it if it's called one in the new uh, system and things like that, right? In this case, it's just a flag to clone. Uh, you can separate then all or just some of the namespaces. If you clone network, it allows you basically to see different network interfaces. The way you use this is uh, you create a, an interface, you put it in a different, you create a couple of interfaces, then you split them in a separate namespace, or actually you first, okay, let's, let's go through this. Um, you clone a process, this creates a network interface, a network namespace which is empty, so it doesn't have any interface at all, or perhaps just uh, the loopback interface. And then you can easily create this couple of virtual interfaces that just exist in your kernel, move one of them to the other side, and then basically you have a routed uh, network that just lives in your host that can talk to your process. So your process is effectively insulated, and now you can apply to a single process on your machine all the gains that we were applying before. So you can say basically traffic that comes from this network goes to a separate routing table, gets routed through these GRE tunnels or whatever, and this applies only to the traffic that is actually generated by one process that, for example, you don't trust very much or you want to insulate more, because then that process only sees this virtual interface and comes out to the host through this policied uh, network. So let's see an example with LXC, which helps you to do that. Basically, you don't need to use LXC. You can code all of this at the kernel level in C and libc, but LXC allows you to do this from the shell, which allows you to test it very easily. So you can unshare the network and open a bin bash that is on a separate network. Now you can basically set up a localhost interface, and then on another shell, you can create two virtual network interfaces and up one of them. Then you can move the other VATH to the other interface, and this allows you to add the second IP there and set it up on the second shell. And so this happens in the shell, okay, this, this is clear now. This happens in the shell one, but the second thing up happens only after you've done these commands. So these are the commands that allows you to move things and set it in that particular namespace. Then once you have it up, these two VATH0 and VATH1 can talk to each other and transfer traffic. So this bash and any process indeed that this bash spawns, so if you start a daemon in this bash, it will see only that particular interface and then talk to the machine through this virtual ethernet. Um, open v switch. so this is the updated and new part. What's open v switch and where it does come from? So open v switch at the basic level is just the switch that we're used to have at the bridging level in Linux. What are the differences? One of them is trying to be a little bit less scary for the networking people. So this, is, this supports some protocols that are standard across uh, also proprietary network devices. So for example, OpenFlow is implemented also by Cisco and other devices. So basically you can give up control to your network people and say, look, uh, my virtual machines run on this environment, but you run the network. I set up open the switch, and whatever configuration you push on your routers gets automatic automatically updated on the servers, which means that they can manage centrally the network again at the data center level, and they're less scared about what you're trying to do. It might be important for your organization. Uh, the other thing that it can do is do this conversation between multiple OpenV switches. So if you have this service in multiple data centers, uh, you can easily say, well, I'll have an OpenV switch here, an OpenV switch there. I'll encapsulate OpenV switch data over GRE, which is what I was saying before, basically Ethernet over IP over IP over Ethernet. But it allows you to create an overlay layer two network over layer three which is quite helpful if you want, for example, virtual machines that are in the same 
uh, network to actually be able to talk to each other. Of course, this doesn't scale very well if you try to put over two remote locations a huge uh, internet with many, many people doing lots of broadcast traffic. Uh, this won't work, but for some particular things, it works actually quite better than any of the technologies we were talking about before. Um, it's focused on mobility, so it allows you to basically easily bring up new open V switches and make sure that the central configuration gets easily pushed to them, and then you can move your machines uh, between one host and the other host without having to reconfigure things like uh, your IP table rules and all these other things that you normally have to bring with you all the time. If they are configured at the open v switch level and the open v switches all talk to each other, then you're sorted. Um, this is upstream in Linux 3.3. Uh, as you all know, Weezy runs with Linux 3.2, but luckily the OpenV switch guys packaged the module as an out of three module for Weezy, so this all works with 3.2 and Weezy with the kernel patch, which is just a DK DKMS module that will compile itself and mod probe itself by just installing a package, so quite easy. Um, so how do we do that? Well, just install a bunch of packages as usual, uh, and if you're running Linux 3.2 as shipped with Wizzy, then also install those. If you're running 3.3 because you self-compiled it or you're running experimental or one day there will be backports for this, right? Uh, then no need for the DKMS module anymore. You can just use the upstream one. So what can you do with OpenV Switch? Well, basically, uh, first of all, there is a compatibility level for bridges. So you could use your normal bridge tools if you have the compatibility level installed to just create bridges that actually create OpenV switch bridges. Uh, the big difference there is that while a bridge is completely in kernel, so anything that uh, gets passed through a bridge, the kernel needs to know where to send it. With OpenV switch, the, the kernel still keeps a cache of where to send things for efficiency, but it can go to a user space if it doesn't know. So it can say, well, this is a new traffic. I don't know about it. I'll ask OpenV switch. And OpenV switch can go ask some remote switch or look in some database. So can do a lot more things than what the kernel can normally do. So you don't need to push all your table in of information inside your, your kernel. What you need to do is making sure that OpenV switch knows where the traffic goes. Then your kernel can only have a mapping for the traffic it's actually passing through. And all the rest can stay in user space where it can be paged out or store into disk and not bother your normal tables. So we can add bridges either with this or with the compatibility module. Uh, we can add ports to the bridges. This is just basically sugar over the normal thing, right? But this allows you to set an OpenV switch enabled bridge. Um, you can add a fake switch, which is basically a VLAN tagged switch. Normally, you would do this by just creating a new switch and then adding an interface which has VLAN tags on the switch. Um, OpenV switch allows you to do it in different ways. One way is these fake switches, and one way is just to say, I'll create only one switch, but whatever traffic comes in from a particular port, tag it with this VLAN. So this is quite a change of game. We don't need to have many switches, one per VLAN, but we can use one switch and tag the VLANs on the source ports like a real switch would do. Um, so a real physical switch will have a configuration that says all the traffic that comes from port one is actually on VLAN three. Well, here we can actually do this without uh, going for the, I'll separate physical switches. And finally, uh, the other way is instead just add a tap to the fake switch, which is basically what we were doing before. Um, so creating another virtual bridge rather than uh, tagging single ports inside the bridge. It supports both ways. Uh, QoS, haha. So this is actually cut, I should. But well, this is quite well documented, and I'll put these non-cut on the internet, so you don't need to see and copy the command line now. But basically, OpenV switch has native QoS inside the switch. So it allows you to set some ports to have some particular uh, policing normal rate and some maximum burst rate, which is 
how much traffic you can do when there's a burst of traffic, but not at the average level. Um, once you configure this, again, you configure it once for your whole open switch infrastructure, hopefully, and then you don't need to think about it again when you move virtual machines around and things like that, because all the open switches will talk to a central database or a central point. Now, I haven't tried the cluster mode yet. I plan to, but I was mostly experimenting on my laptop, and I didn't have all the VMs set up to do this on many of them, so I'm waiting to go back and have a data center to play with. Um, GRE encapsulation, uh, it's what we were saying before. So we can actually add a, port, a GRE port to the switch and then specify that that port is actually a GRE interface with a, some particular remote IP. Same thing on the other side. And then the two switches will be able to talk to each other at layer two, encapsulated over GRE. VXLAN is just a different protocol to do so. It comes from the networking people who weren't happy with GRE. Uh, I'm still not completely sure about all the differences and similarities. Uh, they perform pretty much the same according to some benchmarks I've seen, but your network people may prefer one or the other depending on what their actual physical switches support, so you may be forced to use one or the other. Um, what is this? Okay, this is the uh, open flow thing. Sorry, I cut the title. I need to fix these slides. Um, they were looking good on my laptop, I swear. <laughs> uh, so we can create a central controller. Uh, this is an example. The controller could be on a physical switch or on a router managed by your network people, or could be actually on an OpenV switch box. And then you can, on your switches, set what the controller is to, to actually have a single infrastructure. Of course, then this OVS controller becomes a single point of failure, so you start having all your problems like, let's have two of them, let's load balance over them, let's make sure that they keep in sync and things like that. So uh, this is the really, really basics, but then there's going to be more needed to make an actual good network infrastructure on top of this. Um, user space fun, so all of these were technologies involving both the kernel and some user space to, to do something. You can do something in pure user space, uh, for example, use OpenVPN to do encrypted IP or Ethernet tunnels to, well, this is just a VPN, right? We, we all know about this, uh, but it integrates with all that we've said before, and it can allow us to say, well, for example, uh, my traffic that is non-encrypted because the protocol doesn't support encryption, like pass it over the VPN link. The rest of the traffic that I know it's already SSL, why wasting my time and pass it over the VPN link, pass it over the non-encrypted link. Um, VDE is a user space virtual switch. If you don't have OpenV switch, you can use VDE to play with all of this in user space uh, without even being root. Um, and Socket is a very nifty tool. It's like Netcat, but it can do a lot more. So you can cut, for example, from a network TCP port to a Unix socket or to a pipe. So it allows you to deal with any kind of possible streams and put them one to the other. Uh, we use it, for example, to connect uh, from standard input to uh, KVM console, because the KVM people weren't as good as the Xen people to implement this very nice console service. So you just usually connect your virtual serial console to, uh, well, in our case, we connect it to a Unix socket, and then we use socket to connect to that Unix socket. It would be oh, cool. 10 minutes, wow, I'm done then. Um, so to do for next few years and bore you some more or have some more fun, um, more open vSwitch, uh, more open flow, and so do this traffic integration between different switches. Uh, have a look at S-Flow that allows you to do monitoring of data open, over open vSwitch. So this allows your open vSwitches to report how much data is used by the various interfaces to a central point. Um, try this cluster level for the OpenV switch, and try to see if I can attach the OpenV switch to an unbound GRE tunnel to do this in a completely decentralized way through IP 
lookup table rather than specifying what the remote endpoint is. Uh, but this is just to do's and ideas I have. I haven't tried any of this. So Q&A, suggestion, hints, any other questions? There are, at this point, I think nine minutes. So we're perfectly on time. Um, I have a question more going back to the routing daemons. Yes. Um, have you actually tried using a routing daemon on commodity hardware on Linux with substantial traffic, or is this just usable for experiments? Um, so I know some of our teams do it for uh, actually running road load balancers. So they advertise the load balancer's IP through a routing daemon. I don't know how substantial the traffic is. It's basically substantial traffic, but just for one server, that one service that needs to be load balanced. Um, that might not be for a whole data center. But then again, the routing daemon doesn't need to point to itself. So the daemon needs only to scale to the point at which it advertises the right routes then the traffic doesn't need necessarily to pass there. You could actually divide this traffic between many actual physical boxes if your actual hardware box is not uh, a very good network device or is not a completely dedicated network device and can't handle the whole traffic. Yeah, yeah. I acknowledge it's probably more a question about the performance of the Linux networking and routing stack than about the routing daemon Yeah, so I, I think your question one was more, have you tried routing huge amounts of traffic through a, an actual Linux box rather than just using the routing daemon over the yeah, Linux box? Maybe. I think routing, routing huge amounts of traffic, unless you have lots of network interfaces and lots of cores dedicated to this, as we know, will not work, but we can scale, scale horizontally and use more boxes, basically use more load balancers, or indeed just from the switches, use the routing daemon to actually allow us to, for example, do any cast over many, many uh, boxes. So divide the traffic to many of them rather than centralize this, which we would need if it was one box on an internet without routing. What's um, much traffic? <laughs> yes. So well, one gigabit or multiple gigabits should be enough for a modern server. Multiple 10 gigabits is what modern servers are difficult to do with. But multiple gigabits is fine. Multiple 10 gigabits is not, basically, as a rule of thumb. Nobody else. I think everybody is completely too confused by this, or they all knew about it, or there's an interesting conversation on IRC. <laughs> I think, he, oh, okay. Um, one question about Open vSwitch. Does it actually incorporate any kind of encryption if you stack multiple yes. Open vSwitch instances? Yes. So you can either do it unencrypted, if, for example, you are running on a private network, or you can use SSL, and it has its own um, PKI, so you can point it at the certification authority. You can do SSL tunnels, so you can do actually SSL over GRE, over blah, and so on. So yes, it does that. I think there's a question by uh, okay. Zobel on IRC. How does Open vSwitch work with UCARP? With what? UCARP. No idea. Okay. He, he had a question. I'll, I'll look at it, actually. I, I really have no idea. Ah, no, I, I thought you had a question. Sorry for pointing him at you. Well, then enjoy your 10 minutes, go for a coffee, and have a good lunch. Thank you. Thank you.